bummer. Anyway, the problem is we uh, we were trying to time the video so that the <laughs> counter started at one, and the whole class is laughing at me because I'm talking to my computer. So we've made a um, uh, a counter with the JK flip flops that go uh, one, three, five, seven, nine, and we've thrown in some bus work to go around and make it a little bit easier. And uh, but there's still some a little bit of work to go, and our space bar does a reset to one, so if you hit the space bar, it goes to one, and then it starts counting up again. Okay, so that's what that was all about, and uh, we'll minimize him. This is, the, uh, despite all the humor in the room, this is the digital circuit class, which is pretty funny, because digital circuits, uh, we're just a bunch of ones and zeros, and uh, show of hands, how many zeros in the room? Yeah, half the hands are up now, okay, that's good. Not really, but do they? We're in chapter 11, which has to do with practical considerations. All right, so um, practical considerations. Okay, well, um, if we have a clock that's a uh, positive clock um, pulse, so this thing's going to change on the positive clock. If that happens, then where exactly is that positive clock? in relationship to everything else that's going on. Now, if we stay in, in, we're in, in a millisecond time frame, then obviously this thing goes straight up and down, and it's not a problem. We don't have to consider things like that. But if, if we look at a nanosecond time frame, then this, this sharpness of my edge trigger going up is more like that. And now exactly where in that motion um, will that clock pulse activate whatever it is, and will that make a difference? So uh, you say, well, um, if I, let's say I've got a 30-second um, shot clock for the basketball team, it probably won't make any difference, right? But if I have a, a um, some clock set to, to time the nuclear weapon blowing up, then it could make a difference, and uh, the nanosecond time frame could make a difference, and I might, might uh, want to worry about that. We have a new vocabulary word to add to our vocabulary, and it's called racing. And um, normally, when you think of racing, you're, you're thinking of your uh, your wife driving the car down I-80, right? That's how she normally drives. She races and she passes everybody, and and including the police car that was there and things like that. Or it could be your husband that was doing that, or your boyfriend. Right? You're racing. You normally think, but if you think of a of an RS flip flip flop, um, it could very well be that the timing of that flip flop causes the output to just go up and down, up and down, up and down very quickly, and that's called racing. So you think about that that flip flop, and and you had a a guy like this, and an R and an S, and and. Uh, the R goes in there, and the S goes in there, and he comes over to this side, and he goes over that side. Q, not Q, or the other way around. Well, the timing of these signals going back and forth might cause the circuit to race. And especially when you throw in the clock thingy, so when you got some gate sitting there, and, and you're you have a gate coming in, and, and now you, you have the R and the S guy going through that. That gate. Now you've got a timing problem. You, you could end up racing going on. So you have a racing thing. So I'm looking at page 487, and I've got a JK flip flop, and uh, I see that my my clock pulse is not going straight up and down, but it's taking its sweet time going up and down, and it's taking. Uh, Yeah, so, and it's a negative clock pulse. So on the, on the way down, I'm supposed to be doing something. And, uh, and I say, uh, from the J, K, J, and K. So the J, the J and K are doing something. And uh, okay, so the J and K are doing something too. 
whatever it is. And from the time the J and K do something until that clock pulse has an effect, there's a settling time of 12 nanoseconds. And then there's another 2 nanoseconds before it happens again. It, it sees that I went down, but I can't do anything about it because I'm at the negative clock pulse. So there's going to be a time um, when I may or may not toggle, depending on whether or not I, I get that the toggle happens before the clock pulse. And so that's what it's showing us there. Do we really care? No. The, t the clock is either going to work or the, the, the counter is either going to work or it's not. And if it's not, we're just going to throw it away and buy one that does. Okay. So when you think of the idea of a practical consideration inside of 14 nanoseconds, 10 to the minus 9 seconds, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it anyway? Yeah, where did this author come up with this idea anyway? All right, so I'm looking at page 489, and I'm seeing that um, the reset is, is happening, uh, but it's going to take some time for that Q. It's going to take 30 nanoseconds before that Q actually does reset and goes back to zero. And the set happens, and it's going to be 20 nanoseconds before that it actually does. So my, my asynchronous guys, um, 30 nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds before something actually happens. Um, again, I'm, I don't think I'll worry about it too much. All right. Then data sheets, 492, 493, 494, 495. More data sheets. And um, then we uh, do something we don't do. Automatic resets. This is what we talked about on Thursday, and you told me you knew nothing about it. Okay. What page are you on? I'm on page uh, 503 already. That's a learning disability. I'm on 305, right? Yeah, really, 503. All right. And I've got five volts, and I've got a switch. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn, I'm gonna, I have five volts, and i got some switch. And uh, I have, um, what do I got? A 1K resistor, and i got a capacitor. And my capacitor is 0 0.001 microfarad. All right, that looks good. And I'm gonna um, I'm gonna send this over here, and I'm gonna see what am I sending it to? I'm sending this to well, I'm getting this from VCC, so I'm getting I'm sending it to I'm sending VCC over there to power the chip, and I'm sending uh, something over here. I'm sending that to um, the uh, reset knot in the, uh, oh, both the reset knot, data one and reset data two knot. All right, that's what I'm doing. I have, this guy's grounded. So if I'm, if I'm zero here, that zero becomes a one, and that one resets the, um, the thing, and it's always going to be reset, and it's always going to be one. But as soon as I turn on power, then at some point, I get a 1, logic 1 there, that logic 1 turns to a 0, and I quit resetting. So now the issue is, is there any issue at all? The issue is, how long is it going to take from the time I shut the switch until I get something pretty close to 5 volts on that line? Okay? And in circuit analysis, you're going to find that there's a time constant associated with an RC circuit. This is an R, that's a C. And believe it or not, it is RC. How could that be so simple? So, so I look at that and say, well, what's, what's R times C? Well, this is 1K, 10 to the third, 0 0.001 micro, 10 to the minus 6. So I'd be 0 0.001 times 10 to the minus 3. So this would be 
1k times. Is there any one it's one? about time I have support from the back row, from the middle row. Okay. So we're, we're back to here. 1k times 0.11 microfarad will give me 1 microsecond. So I got, I got 10 to the third. I got point I got one times ten to the six seven eight nine minus nine, which gives me ten to the minus six one microsecond. All right, so one microsecond is the um, is the time constant, but on a charging the time constant is only going to give you sixty three percent of the of the charge you're getting to so if I start at zero and I am up here at five volts then at one microsecond I'm going to be at 63 percent of five volts now if I would have brought my calculator I'd know what that was but I didn't so you're going to get to about three volts in one microsecond and then we say one two three four at five con time constants we're going to be essentially fully charged. 3.15 volts. 3.15 volts. So one time constant, we're going to be at 3.15 volts. Is that enough? Yes, closer to five than it is to zero. That may or may not be enough, but somewhere between one and two time constants, we're definitely going to be there. So I'm, it's going to be in zero long enough to reset it because it only needs nanoseconds to reset. And in the microsecond time frame, by the next second microsecond, it's going to go in and go to to a one, which is going to produce a zero because it's inverted, which means it's not going to be reset anymore. So that's how on on power up, I can I can ensure that I start with the right number. Um, this is slightly more complicated than that. Would you like to see it slightly more complicated? Mm -hmm. All right, slightly more complicated. That what I showed you is what you, as a technician, will need to know and understand. Okay, what I'm about to show you now is what you, as an electrical engineer, would need to know and understand. Okay, so there's two different issues: there's the technician person, which I'm training you to be, and then there's the electrical engineer person, which, after calculus two and differential equations, you could go and do too if you wanted to. Okay, so. From a, from a, yeah, you don't want to know that. Okay, so uh, I've got a resistor and I got a capacitor, and you're not there yet in, in circuit analysis yet either. So that's unfortunate. What is the voltage across the resistor? IR, right? IR, very good. Uh, what is the voltage across the capacitor? Uh, it's going to be Q over C. The charge on the capacitor over the capacitance of the capacitor is going to be the voltage of the uh, across the capacitor. Now, Kirchhoff's law says what? It says that this 5 volts has to be the sum of the voltage across the resistor plus the voltage across the capacitor. So 5 volts has to be IR plus Q over C. Okay, well that, so far that, that made relatively good sense in your circuit analysis class, I would hope. Now, what is current? Anybody can tell me what current is? No, current is the movement of charge, right? So current is the change in charge over some change in time. So if I have five coulombs of charge passing something in one second, then I have one amp, right? And, and you've done that already, I would hope. Okay, so now, from that point of view, my current at times t is a change in charge, change in time, and now my equation becomes 5 volts is equal to dq dt r plus q 
over C, and that becomes a, a first order differential equation which you solve after calculus one. Okay, and that's what you would do, you'd solve it. But in your circuit analysis class, we skip that step and just show you the solution. Okay, and then you say, oh, okay, I believe that, and then that, that's fine too. But, but that's, that's the more difficult part. Okay, you didn't want to know that, so we're proceeding on. But there is a, a way to automatically reset on power off your JK flip flop system by using a capacitor and a resistor. That, that's the whole point of that section. There is a way to do it. Okay, now we're going to talk about Schmidt triggers. Why not? It's been a long time since we had a Schmidt in the class. So after World War II, during World War II, we had a lot of development of integrated circuits to support the war. And after World War II, all those scientists came out of the military and started building things in their garages. And one of those things, Schmidt was one of them, and he built this thing called the Schmidt Trigger. And um, we need a new vocabulary word, hysteresis. Is that new? OK, hysteresis. H-Y-S-T-E-R-E-S-I-S, -E hysteresis, R-S-I-S. And um, it's, not, it's not the feeling you feel before you walk into a digital circuit class. You know, it's not, that's not the feeling. But um, normally speaking, if I take a switch, so here's a switch, and I turn it on, What's going to happen? It's going to turn on, right? Mm -hmm. And I turn it off, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. It's going to turn off. So if I, if I make a plot time versus voltage like that, I would see that if, I, if I'm going this way and I turn it on, it's going to look like that. And if I'm going this way and I turn it off, it's going to look like that, OK? What hysteresis does is make the path for turning on different than the path for opening. Different? Give me a break. So I'm going to turn it on. This is time and voltage. I'm going to turn it on, and it turns on there. So it goes up that way. And then when I come back and I turn it off, I want to turn it off turns off there. So it's a different path for turning on and turning off. So um, let's say I'm going down the highway, I'm going down I-80, and I get off at exit 8. Do I get on at exit 8 the same place I got off at exit 8? No. no, I didn't. So it's sort of like an, an interchange on a superhighway, I get off the off-ramp, but I go on the on-ramp, they're two different paths, okay? And that's, that's the same thing here. And we, we call that situation hysteresis. Now, why in the world would we want something like that? Why would we want some? Sure Schmidt's going to tell us. Schmidt is going to want to tell us. And it comes back to what happens when I close the switch. And we already discussed that. When I turned on the switch, it goes on, right? Because we as human beings uh, understand and see and feel at the awesome 10, 17 hertz rate, which isn't very fast in general. Not very fast. 17 microseconds. No. Can somebody come through the door, come over here, hit me on the side of the head, and walk out the door inside of 17 microseconds? If they could, would you see them? You wouldn't see them, you'd just see what they left. The you, you would not see them, you wouldn't see a blur, you might feel a wind passing by you. You, you would, you probably would feel the wind passing by you. Now, uh, we remember our Star Trek episode where some aliens, so aliens went and put some drops into the captain's water 
and he sped up a thousand times. Yeah, yeah. and you and you remember that that Spock saw through what was going on, and and the wind was going by, and 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 uh, he he slowed down the tape and and heard what they're actually saying. Do you think you feel that wind in the nanosecond? Really? Because it, because yes, because it's a, it's a body as big as mine moving that fast by you. The effect of that moving by you is going to last longer than that. Yeah. So a vacuum, as I move that fast through the room, a vacuum is forming behind my body. And that vacuum is now sucking in the air of yeah. the room, and you're going to feel it. Yes. I believe that you would feel well, it. Then, uh, yeah. Anyway, you, you, remember, you remember that Star Trek episode. Now, the problem is... Uh, what is work? Yeah, what is work? Well, it's something none of you do. Okay, that's fine. Uh, work is force over a distance. Okay. And so there's a certain amount of work that I do walking from here to the door. Okay. What's power? Power would be that work divided by time. So if it takes me five seconds to walk to the door, I, uh, it takes a certain amount of power for me to do that. Mm -hmm. That's good for my weight control program, right? But if I do it a thousand times quicker, and this time, besides from being, is now not four seconds anymore, but point zero zero four seconds what happens Time the amount of power goes up so what yeah so power just went up by a factor of 1000 on me walking to the door now that's also good for my weight control program my, my <laughs> muscles are going to get toned up really quick here aren't they try right. but uh, it's going to be more and more difficult for me to get to the door if i if i do if i do that and i decide i'm going to stop here and pick up this water, it won't move. We won't see it. I know, I can't move it. I won't be able to move it. It's too heavy. I don't have enough power, I don't have enough strength oh, well, to get it off the table. And because work is <clears throat> okay. Yeah, exactly. So um, I, I now have this awesome ability to move a thousand times faster than you do. Okay? And, and so I got a gun, and I pulled the trigger, and I can actually go faster than the bullet, right? And I have a knife, and I'm, I'm standing everybody in the room. But I can't pick up the knife. I can't make the knife move. See, that, that's the issue. I can't, the tri the guy, I can't hold the gun, let alone pull the trigger, and I can't get my body to stand up straight to even walk out of the room. All, all of those wait, things. Wait, 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 wait. If this time goes down, power goes up. Yeah. Consequently, when power goes up, work goes up. So you're lessening your ability to work because you're using more for the power, is what you're saying. Yes. Okay. Exactly. That's the way to look at it. So, so wait, you said your body doesn't move either. So, how are you? Doing? It would be difficult for my body to move that fast, yes. But I, I would have, I don't have the muscular tone. If I was given the, abil if I was given the ability to do that, by some chemical, I could, still couldn't physically do it because I don't have the muscular tone to move from here to the door in four microseconds. And you'd be one hell of a weight yeah. and win. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And so um, I could I could go into ranger training, right? And and if I and, and be trained to do that, you know, I could take several years of muscular training. Um, the uh, other guys that are cool in our science fiction genre are the guys that come from the heavy planets. So if you come from a planet that's 10 times the mass of the Earth, and now you had 10 times of gravity growing up, well, your heart would be different. Your muscular tone would be different. And now you take that person and put him on an Earth-type gravity planet, he's going to be 10 times stronger than you are. He's going to be able to move 10 times quicker than you are. He's gonna. He's gonna. Probably can't think quicker than you do because you know, thinking is a different thing. But but he's gonna have a different bone and and um, 
muscular structure than we as human beings have because the gravitational field required that. If you go to the moon, I'm going to I'm going to send you to the I'm going to send you to the moon to hang out for ten years. What's going to happen when I bring you back to Earth? You're going to die. Your heart won't be able to pump the blood anymore because your body has been physically adapted to one sixth the, the gravity. I'm I'm going to have to bring you back gradually. I'm going to have to work up your muscle tone again. So you have to like you have to like slowly readapt to Earth. Yeah. So it's like. They did that. Didn't they talk about something like that with the astronauts? That's right. Back? Right now we're doing an experiment right now with two astronaut twin brothers. One's on the Earth and one's up there in the space capsule for six months. And we're doing that right now. We're, we're seeing, you know... So how do they gradually how we gonna, bring them back? They're how just we, like how slowly we do that? out into the Earth? <laughs> well, um, what you have to do is you have to keep up your muscle tone while in space. So you'd have to work out more. To make up, yeah, can't do it while you're on Earth, right? Okay. Well, back to back to why a Schmidt trigger. So when I take this switch and go high to low, when I move the switch, it doesn't do this. It does something like this. Okay, and it takes about ten um, microseconds to get from there to there. Why? Huh? Why? The, switch. Yeah, the, the switch bounces. It's called bounce. So if I go and I turn the switch off, here I got a switch over here. I'm going to go turn it off. Is it bouncing? I mean, I don't see it. Of course not, because it's doing in, it's doing quicker than the 17 hertz that we can see it bouncing. Oh. So if I were to be able to see it, that's right. But if you had an oscilloscope that was operating at one megahertz, getting a picture of that electrical circuit, you could see the bounce. So on page uh, so you 504, it. you have bounce, yep. and uh, this is important. Let's say that I've got a Coke machine, and I'm going to put in a quarter. How many quarters do I want the computer to count? while the quarter is going by the switch. I want to count one. Okay, But the computer is sampling that switch a million times a second. How many is the computer going to count unless you do something about it? A lot more than one. So even though we think in a, in a, in a um, 17 millisecond time frame, the computers we're using to do the sampling of our switches are, are thinking very much quicker than that. And we have to go and do something to, to correct that problem. In the Micrologic 1000s, what we do is um, we, we put in a one-shot rising in the circuit to, to hold back that bounce. So now, when this guy turns on, he has to turn off before he can turn back on again. And now I, I, I cut out the bounce from that switch. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be, able to, I won't see the bounce anymore because the one shot rising is going to prevent that from happening. And that's a Schmidt trigger. So I look on page 504 again, I see a Schmidt trigger turning high and low. And I see that on the top of the page, I see the output without a Schmidt trigger, doing it several times because that's DTL logic, but with a Schmidt trigger, it only goes low and goes high once. All right. I can see it again on page 506. On the top of the page, I've got some, some uh, multi-sim simulation. I've got a, a wave that's a, a, a triangular wave and I see it's turning on and off, but it's turning on and off at different voltages as I go up and down. That's, called by the, that's caused by the Schmidt trigger. And on page 509, we have a description of switch bouncing. I didn't make it up. It's actually in the book. And I show, on page 510, I show the switch bouncing not on our time frame, 
but on the time frame of the switch. And I show circuits of how we're going to go and, and make it so that switch bouncing doesn't affect us. So I've got a Schmidt trigger. I've got a, a RS flip-flop doing the same thing. And uh, all right. So, so much for switches. And you thought switches just turn things on and off. That'll teach you. All right. Next, we have pull-up resistors. And uh, I know all of you know what pull-ups are. You're, um, you want them for until you're about four years old, right? And um, so, no? So pull up, pull up yeah. resi resistors are about the same. And we're going to, we want to size the pull up resistor. All right, that's all. Think about your digital circuit lab book. And you had a switch, right? And you had five volts. And you had a resistor. And the switch went to ground. And when the switch was open, you had five volts going to the uh, going to the TTL logic thing, whatever it was, right? And you close the switch, and now it's grounded. So that's a pull-up resistor. So now the issue is, how big should it be? Should it be 1 ohm? Should it be 10 ohms? Should it be 10K? Should it be 10 meg? How big should the pull-up resistor be? And that's what we're going to discuss next. Now we know how big it should be because we've used it, right? All right. Why did you this R? No, it's a roll up. That's the no, no, we're no, supposed no. to pee supposed oh, to be. Oh. You wanna you wanna pee there. No. <laughs> Is that yeah, better? Yeah. Is that better? All right. I see. So I'm I'm not good. sure why the R was there. Pull up resistor. So now we ask ourselves, well, if I'm TTL logic, how many amps do I need? How many what? How many amps do I need to make my TTL logic work? And on page 514, on 514 it says the current input low uh, needs to be uh, 1.6 milliamps. And the current input high needs to be 400 microamps. All right, well, that seems reasonable. So now the issue is um, how, and let's see, we got two more things there voltage, input low, um, 0 0.8 volts, voltage input high, um, 2.0 volts. Okay, so those are things that we know. And now, if I make this guy the wrong size, I'm going to limit my current, and I won't have enough current to turn this guy on. Bummer. So I want 40 you said 400, you might want to change that. 40. 40 micro. Oh, okay. 40 micro amps. So if I have 40 micro amps that I need, and I have um, how many volts? Let's see. V is equal to IR. R is equal to V over I. Okay, so that's Ohm's law sitting up there. So I'm gonna take my voltage. I want to go. I want to go high. I want 2.0 volts. I have 2.0 volts. I'm gonna divide it by the current, 40 micro amps. And what do I get? And I didn't bring my calculator, so I have no clue. Um, 50 kilos. Is that 50 kilo ohms? Okay, so if I make this guy... Wait, what did you make? Oh, you got 50 kilos? I got 50. 40 milliamps, right? Micro. Oh, 10 to the minus 6. Micro, okay. No, it's not micro. Yeah, it's like... 10 to the micro 6. Yeah, 10 to the minus 6. 
Okay, so as long as I'm I'm less than 50 kilo ohms, I'm okay. And now we look at the other situation. The low, uh, yeah, the low guy, 0.8 volts divided by 1.6 milliamps. What do I get? 500 ohms. No, you don't. 500 ohms. 500 ohms. EE3. EE3. 0.8 over 1.6. Milli. 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 Oh, milli. Oh. Milli. Your milli looks like your freaking micro. Oh, excellent. Anyway, so as long as long. Uh, clearly, we use 10k because that's what we've been doing. So, if I but we um, we need to size the uh, pull-up resistor so that we don't so that the circuit will work. We could make it too big, and then it wouldn't work. That wouldn't be good at all. Okay, um, power supplies, page 515. Power supplies are in the devices class next semester. So I've got uh, 120 volts uh, AC. I go through a transformer, uh, which is part of the circuit analysis class this semester. We go through, to get us down to, in this case, 12.6, we go through a, a bridge rectifier. The bridge rectifier is something we don't get to until next semester in circuit in the, the devices class again. And um, the diodes only go one way. So if I can put them in right the first time, that'd be pretty cool. Let's see if I can get them in right the first time. All right, so when I'm negative on top, I'll be negative there. The negative can't go this way. The negative has to go that way around here through my resistor back that way over to there. When I'm positive, on the positive half cycle, I'm positive, I come positive, current goes that way, this way, through my resistor, um, back from my resistor into there, <clears throat> back through that guy, and I'll be, and I'll like that. Okay, so my, what happens is my resistor, my load, load, sees current going the same way if I think of it as positive current. So I get the, what that does is that changes my AC current to DC current. But that gives me a ripple every cycle. So I throw in a couple capacitors to get rid of the ripple. And that's what the capacitor is there. And then I, I throw in a, um, a voltage rectifier to hold the voltage up. Uh, the, um, the 7805 to hold the, hold the voltage in one spot. All right, so that's what I do. All right, turn the page. Anything else? I think we're done. Mm, oh, yeah. All right, well, what's the word? I, I have some input signal. Um, do I want it destroyed because I'm using it to do something to the output? Or do I want to keep it as pure as can be, as the driven snow? Yeah. So, it, it, so I've got some device. i got some input from some device. And I'm connecting that to an output type thing, whatever it might be. If this output guy destroys the input signal, then, then I'm really hosed. That, that, that would be bad. So I use an optical device. Optical. Uh, light. And uh, so I, I come in and my, my input signal comes in. It makes... Uh, a light thingy, 
some photons. I make some photons. And then the photons hit a uh, transistor, and now the transistor uh, does whatever it does to send the signal through. But I have, I have decoupled the signal, the input signal from the output signal, completely and totally. Okay, now if I do the same thing with a transformer, so I got a transformer, I got 120 volts here, and I got 12 volts there, I haven't decoupled those guys. If, if I draw more amps here, if the amperage here goes up, then the amperage here has to go up. I don't, I don't have a choice. But on the other side, uh, whatever's happening here doesn't affect the input at all. The input is just sending some photons across the, a small uh, distance to make something happen. We normally get these guys uh, eight at a time. So we call that a quad optical coupler. And we do have a digital circuit lab where we hook up quad optical couplers and uh, turn things on. All right, so they can turn on relays, they can turn on motors. Oh, time to do the homework. And that's the purest form of the system. I hope I, I hope I assigned only homework problems I can do. Wouldn't that be good? 11-1. Sketch the Q output waveform of the 74LS76 given the input waveform shown in figure P111. Use the following. Settling time low, 20 nanoseconds. Settling time high, 20 nanoseconds. It looks like they wasted ink there. Time high from the low state, zero nanoseconds. That's pretty cool. Times high from the high state, zero nanoseconds. I doubt that too. Promagation time low to high, zero nanoseconds. Promagation time, uh, high to low, zero nanoseconds. Okay, so that was pretty simple. And there is figure P11.1. All right, so that's P11.1. We see that we have a um, R, D, and we start low and we go high. So that's <clears> the, um, the reset. And then we got a negative clock pulse. And we're going to start high and go low, and then we're going to go high, and then we're going to go low, and then we're going to go high, and then we're going to go low, and then we're going to go high, and then we're going to go low, and then we're done. And then we see a K. And the K is going to be... Um, low, then it's going to go high, and it's going to come way over here, and it's going to go low again, and then it's going to go high again there, and go over there. Okay, I got that. And we have um, between there and there. There and there I have uh, 25 nanoseconds, right? and, and I got 30 nanoseconds there to there, 30 nanoseconds, and then I've got 10 nanoseconds over here, 10 nanoseconds. Okay, and we have the J guy, and the J guy is one, he's already one. So when K is low, I do I, I do a reset because J is high. And when K is high, I do a toggle. So and it's a negative clock pulse, so it can only happen 
on the negative side of the clock is the only time anything can happen. Okay, so I got that. And I want to know what Q is. What is Q? Okay, well, I don't know. I don't know what Q is until, wait a minute, if this guy's low, he becomes a 1, right? So I know what Q is. Q is high. So Q is going to start high. High. Okay, so Q is high. Everything's fine. Now, the clock pulse happens. Is 25 nanoseconds enough for this guy to do a toggle on me? That's the issue. All right. I need 20 nanoseconds settling time going to high. And I have zero promulgation delays and everything. So I need, I need 20 nanoseconds and I have 25. So in fact, that's enough time and I'm going to see a toggle at that point. I'm going to toggle low. And um, I have no promulgation delay, so that means it toggles low right away. Okay, so that boom, down. I come back over to here, and uh, the clock pulse happens again. I'm going to toggle again. Now I'm high. I come over here, and I see 30 nanoseconds. Well, if 25 nanoseconds was good enough, and I only need 20, then um, 30 should be good enough too. So I'm going to go low. And then I get back over here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is, um, I don't toggle though, because I'm not high anymore. So nothing happens on that clock pulse. I come over here. Just about to tell you. Yeah, I can. I can just imagine. I was waiting for somebody to uh, Edwin from the back row to yell and scream that I went the wrong way. Anyway, now we're here, and we need 20 seconds of, t of settling time before that clock pulse sees that K is high. It doesn't see K as high. I stay high the whole time. So I needed. I needed 20 nanoseconds to settle that high guy out, I only have 10 nanoseconds. That's not enough. Now your line is in the middle of that. Of the That's right. Ball. It happens in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to happen in the middle. All right. So that's what my cue is going to look like for those reasons. 11.9. Um, Eleven nine. One particular Schmidt trigger inverter has a positive going threshold of 1.4 volts. Okay, so um, this is my voltage. Positive going threshold, 1.9 volts. And a negative going threshold, let's see, we'll use green. Negative going threshold, of 0.7 volts. It's voltage out high typically is 3.6 volts. So up here I have 3.6 volts. And it's typical low, voltage out low is 0.2 volts. So I'm not at zero there. I'm at 0 0.2 volts on that line. So by zero, that's where zero volts is. All right. Do you have <clears throat> volts on, on both of your... Yes. That's right. I have volts on the x-axis, volts on the y-axis. Yeah, I sure do. Sketch the transfer function. Oh, I'm done. That was so easy, I'm sure that's going to be on your next <clears throat> test. I'm positive it will be. If I can do it, you can do it, right? Yeah. yeah, write that down. Want me to do that again? I'll do it again. Okay, so I got a, there we go. I got X, I got Y. Okay. I've got a negative, uh, I've got a 
positive going threshold of 1.9 volts. So 1.9 volts, I'm going to go up. And at 0.7 volts, 0.7 volts, I'm going to go down. And my voltage high, output high, typical, is 3.6 volts. And my low typically is 0.2 volts. So I'm going to come ooh, that way, up there, up there, and then I'm going to come back, maybe like that. All right? And I'm going to go that way, and I'm going to go that way. There we go. Is that better? That's better. That's much better. Okay. 11, 9, 11, 11. Okay, 11, 11. I don't know. 531? Oh, yeah. Yeah. 11, 11. If the wave form shown below is fed into a 7414 Schmidt trigger inverter, sketch the output waveform. Okay, well, that should be simple enough. I mean, we, all we got to do is sketch the waveform here. Okay, so I got um, 0.4, and we go up to 2.4, and now uh, we go high, and we go low, and we go high, and we go low. <clears throat> okay, and now we got to find the 1714, 7414 Schmidt trigger. And, um, hmm. 1714 Schmidt trigger. Here's a 1714. I found it. Page 508 on the top. The, uh, and it's an inverter, and it's going to happen at 0 0.8, and it's going to happen at 2, no, it's going to happen at 0.8, so um, there's 0.8, and where's the other side going to happen? transfer function. Hmm, looks like a 0.8 and a 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'll draw these guys to there, to there, to there. And I'll draw the 0.17 to there, to there, to there, to there. And it is an inverter. Okay. So I said that. So I got it. All right, there we go. So we're going to start high. Something's going to happen right there. Something could happen there. Something could happen there. Something could happen there. 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 I'm not saying it will happen there. I'm just saying it can. Okay, now I got my signal. I'm going to start high because this is an inverter. So I'm starting high and then I'm going low. Then I'm coming over here and I'm going high again. Going over there and I'm going low again. And then I'm going to come here and I'm going to go high again. Okay. So a Schmidt trigger inverter when low will be high and when high will be low. Oh wonderful. Okay, eleven eleven. Eleven seventeen. Okay. 
In the figure 1147, assume that the phototransistor has an on resistance of 1K and an off resistance of 1 meg. Determine the voltage at point A when light is striking and when light is not striking. Okay, so um, on we have a 1K, off, we have 1 meg. I got that. Now I got to find the figure. Figure um, 1147. Okay, so I got figure 1147. I see it. Okay, and uh, so on is when the, the thing is, is photoing. Okay, so so um, when I'm on, what I see is 5 volts. I see a, a 100K resistor. I see a, a 1K resistance of the uh, guy, and I see a ground. And I want to know what the voltage out is. So that's what I want to do. OK. And in circuit analysis, you have voltage divider, right? Voltage divider says the voltage of the branch is equal to the resistance of the branch divided by resistance total times voltage total, right? So 5 volts times 1K divided by 1K plus 100K. Um, one five volts uh, divided by one divided by one oh one. Um, <laughs> we'll go with uh, five fifty fifty millivolts millivolts. Okay, we'll go with fifty millivolts because I didn't bring my calculator. And uh, so that's when I'm on. All right now. When I'm off, I start with 5 volts. I go through 100K, and I have 1 meg, 1 meg, and I go to ground, and I want to know the voltage out. And again, we're going to do voltage divider, so the voltage of the branch is voltage total, 5 volts, resistance of the branch, 1 meg ohm. How come I have meg K? Who, who, who allowed me to have meg K? Must have been that front row again. 1 meg ohm divided by 1 meg ohm plus 100 K. Right, so that's 5 times 1 over 1, 1, 1. 1. Yeah. Um, you get 100 kilos in 1 mega. I look at the figure on page 517. I see that I have 5 volts and a 100K resistor. On page 517, halfway down the page, all the way to the left. So I've got 5 volts, 100 kilo ohms. The guy is off, and when he's off, the resistance of the transistor is 1 meg ohms. That was given to us in the problem. OK? So now the issue is, what is 5 times 1 over 1 1.5? Um, I don't know, um, 4 point something. Um, approximately 5 volts. Oh, yeah, that's good. Don't have my. Oh, I got a calculator. 4.55. All right, 4.6 volts. That's the front row. All right, so that's fine. That was 17. 21 is next. 11 21. Notice how the problems get so much easier as we go further on in the text. You know, you can't ask anything hard when you, by the time you get to chapter 11. If 
the relay used in figure 1152 has a coil resistance of 100 ohms. Determine the coil current when the MOSFET is on. Assume that R, the resistance drained to source, is 0.2 ohms. Okay, and the resistance of the coil, which is, of course is futile because it is resistance, and all resistance is fuel. Uh, 1152. We gotta find 1152. I found 1151. Okay, so there's 1152. Yeah, 520. Okay, so I see 24 volts. I see the resistance of the coil is 100 ohm. I see a diode that is blocked and can't go that way, so I don't have to worry about him. And then I see the resistance drained to source, and look at that, they have a D and an S right there, 0.2 ohms. And I wanna know, what do I wanna know? I forgot already. Um, using my blah, 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 find the current through the coil. Okay, so uh, V is equal to IR, I think we know that, and I is equal to V over R. V is 24 volts, uh, R is uh, 100.2 ohms, and now all I need is a calculator. You want mine? 24 divided by 100.2 equals what? 240 milliamps. Okay, well, that was pretty good. All right, now we got to do two more. E, so only one more. E112. One more, just one more. E eleven two. And how we come up to this guy here? Where is he? Right there. Load section eleven three B. Open up. What's wrong with you? Uh, problems nine eleven three B. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? Totally gorgeous. Okay. Uh, the Schmidt, the sub-circuit labeled Schmidt trigger one is the circuit device, blah, 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 blah. The function generator is provided to buy blah, 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 blah. If you press expand on the oscilloscope, you will generate the actual measured threshold, blah, blah, blah. From the expanded oscope display, determine VT plus, VT minus VOH and one and VO. All right, so we want to find the time, voltage when the time comes on, voltage when it goes off, the high and the low of the output voltage. Press the AB button and the time base to display, blah, 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 blah. See if it matches what you have. Okay, I think I understand that. Which question is this? E eleven two on page five thirty three. Okay. So I didn't have to read the description box because it's right there in my damn book. <laughs> Who told me to read it? Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna turn this guy on and we're gonna see what happens. Oh, isn't that nice? So the blue guy is the output and uh, and I'm gonna pause it. The blue guy is the output and the red guy is the input. Okay, so back to what we're doing. We want to know VT plus voltage at time when it goes up, voltage at time when it goes down. We want to know the voltage out high, and we want to know the voltage out low. Okay, so those are the things that we want to know. We'll go back to our multi-sim. All right. So we go plus. 
Where is my time thing? Oh, there it is. Okay. We go plus. And the red guy. Get rid of that guy. <clears throat> Why is the sine wave hitting the clock pulse on the down, but not hitting the clock pulse on the up? It's not doing that at all. Okay, so it's not a clock pulse. The blue guy is the output. The blue guy is the output. So when the oh. red guy is 5.5 .5 volts, we go high. Okay, so when, when 5.22, right? 5.22 volts, we go high. 5.522. Okay, 5.5. Well, way to go. Messed up the whole thing. 0.522 volts. We go high. Now, where do we go low? Yeah, get rid of that guy again. Get out of there. Boom. Okay, so we go low at 5, point, at 554 millivolts. Okay, so we come back to um, this guy. 554 millivolts. What is the output high? Okay, so we go back and we look at channel B. And we see that the output high on channel B is 4.5 volts. 4.5 volts. And then we want the output low. So we look for the output low on channel B. And we find that it's a half a volt. Oh, you like 500 milli better? One half volt. Or... 500 millivolts <coughs> or 0 0.5 volts, any of those things. Okay, right, so we did that. Now we're supposed to press the A, B button. And we, and we want to know, does this match the results of part A? Okay, so part B, and uh, we'll answer that first. Yes. Why would it not? It's a computer simulation. <laughs> All right, so where's the damn AB button anyway? There it is, I see it. AB, is that what's supposed <coughs> to be? No, BA, let's hit the BA button. All right, boom. Oh, look at that. A transfer function. And uh, what does it say for uh, high and low? Yeah, 4.5 and 5. Yep, says both of those things. And when do I when do I change? <coughs> well, I can't. I, I don't can't tell. It's too late in the day, and my trifocals are messing up. But um, yes, your oscilloscope will give you the transfer function. It's plotting the B input against the A input instead of normally it gives you. A, some input versus time, but it doesn't have to necessarily do that. Okay. All right, well, we're done. Good enough. Um, you had a circuit analysis test Monday, so that means you should turn in your circuit analysis lab books sometime to, today. It would be good. This week would be good. And um, that would be good, yes. Okay, so do you know what lab we were supposed to have gotten to?